What makes a wine great? How do you sustain a lifelong passion for wine? In our guest's case, more than 60 years writing about it. And what's the difference between wines of curiosity and wines of conviction, especially when it comes to stocking your cellar? Well, tonight you're going to get those tips and stories with our guest, but before I introduce him, let me just say that you are watching the live stream of a recording that I made for my podcast, Unreserved Wine Talk, but I'll be here in the comments live with you. So if you have questions or tips or whatever you want to say, get into the comments and let me know because I'll be answering them there. I'm Natalie McLean and I teach online wine and food pairing classes and you've just joined one of the most passionate groups of wine and food lovers who gather every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern to talk to the most interesting people in the world of wine. Um, before I introduce my guest, let me say that two of you are going to win a copy of his marvelous memoir, The Life and Wines of Hugh Johnson. All you have to do is email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com and let me know that you'd like to win. And there's the book. Well-timed, Hugh. Very good. Product placement. <laughs> That's great. It is, it, it's superb. All right. Back to our guest. Hugh Johnson is the world's best-known wine writer, having sold more than 20 million books worldwide over a 60-year career. He began acquiring his wine knowledge as a student um, and member of the Wine and Food Society at Cambridge University before becoming the feature writer for Vogue and House and Garden magazines. In 1963, he succeeded the legendary gastronome Andre uh, Simon as editor of Food or Wine and Food. At the same time, he ca became the wine correspondent for the Sunday Times, then published his first book at the age of 27, followed by The World Atlas of Wine, Wine Companion, and his annual Pocket Wine Book. His talent for making the subject of wine irresistible is unmatched. He is not only the world's most respected wine writer, but he is also the most loved as his kindness both inside and outside the industry has made him a hero to many, including myself. He joins us now from his home in London, England. Hugh, it's so great to have you here with us. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for, thank you for transporting me all overseas. <laughs> That's great, yes. We're traveling cross-Atlantic tonight. All right. So um, now you and I are both sipping on tea, uh, but it is that time of the day, perhaps sliding into cocktail hour soon. Do you have any wines planned for tonight, this evening that you'll be sipping on? Well, actually tonight, I know that we are having, as we so often do, fish. My wife, Judy, and I are mad about fish, and so... A lot of our wine is white, and uh, among white wines, I have an absolute thing for Chablis. And I, mm. I mean, I would prefer it limited to one white wine in the world. It would be Chablis. So Chablis, that, and why oh, is that? That's the Chardonnay, for those who don't know, from northern Burgundy. But what is it about Chablis that you love so much, Hugh? It's so straightforward. It's an unoaked white wine from Chardonnay, which is the king of white wine grapes there's no question uh, it can do um it can do fancy things it can be subtle it can be extraordinary in that way it can also just be the best damn white wine you ever had to go with what you're <laughs> eating <laughs> so i love that i've got, I got an awful lot of, of chablis from various producers uh, there are many many good producers in that quite small region in the north of france um, <laughs> and uh, I hardly have to think. I just say, yeah, we'll have Chablis again. <laughs> Chablis. It's an easy choice, especially with fish. Um, all right, let's start with your aha moment wine, um, your Damascene moment that happened during a late night tasting with a fellow student at King's College while you're at Cambridge University. Maybe share that with us. Yes, I was um, in our rooms uh, working or pretending to work one evening when in came my roommate in a dinner jacket slightly disheveled i think and said hugh listen you've just got to taste this and um he gave me a glass of red wine so i wasn't reluctant to stop my studies and taste it i said but this is actually good <laughs> i never tasted anything like this i mean where, where, where does it come from and so that, that was really how the, the whole thing started. 
<laughs> wow. And um, did he have like another uh, Burgundian wine there? I'm, I've been reading your memoir, so I kind of know the inside story oh, here, but yeah, were you tasting it, it, another one as well? Yes, there was, a, there was another red wine, which was neither here nor there. I mean, it was just a perfectly decent red wine. So there was huh. this contrast. I mean, it is perfectly true that if you want to look at a wine clearly, it's a very good idea to make a comparison with another wine and you get a focus. So in that, on that occasion, that's quite true. I mean, sip, put that away, no interest, sip. Oh, my goodness. Hey, what's going on here? You know, a different world. Right. Absolutely. And were they located close to each other in terms of where the vines were planted? I don't honestly remember. No, I mean, one came from a okay. famous vineyard in Burgundy, and the other was right. just a red wine. I mean, he was an ordinary drawing my attention to something that I hadn't really considered before. So it was sure, that kind sure. of Damascus moment. Yes. Ah, oh, awesome. Um, now, your college was also well stocked with a certain champagne that I think you had a Churchillian fondness for. What was that one? Ah, I know you mean Paul Roger. <laughs> a certain yes. champagne. I've, I've had an account with the uh, house of Paul Roger drinking the white foil, which is a non-vintage wine, uh, for about 60 years. I first started oh, wow. drinking when I was at, at Cambridge, and I still do. Although, more recently, I've been switching over to something quite different, which is English sparkling wine, because now we have a mm. really, really uh, a successful, indeed a, a brilliant wine industry in England. The moment has come. It's and global warming's got something to do with it, obviously, but we are now using the champagne grapes to make a wine that I am beginning to prefer, quite honestly, to regular really? champagne. Really? To champagne? Yeah. Wow, that's saying something. You go toe-to-toe -to -toe with champagne. It's got a yeah. sort of freshness to it. It's like going into a lovely apple orchard and, and, and it sort of brightens your palate and, uh, and I taste champagne and I think, well, hmm, I'm very used to that, but I find excitement in the English version. We'll have to get to know English champagne better over, or English bubbly, I should say, better over here uh, in Canada, because we don't get it very often, but I've heard marvelous things about it. To be honest, there yeah. isn't much of it. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a new industry. Right. It's, a, it, it's going and to And you're build. drinking it all. There's no doubt about that. Right. Right. Well, save some for us. Send us, a, send some over the Atlantic sometime. <laughs> Um, you describe bubbly as a giggly wine. Um, I love that phrase. Um, and you mentioned a fascinating tidbit um, that's kind of proves that from the scientific perspective. What's happening with, with sparkling wine or bubbly um, as it relates to CO2? Well, it's an interesting thing. When you, when you drink it, you obviously swallowing in the bubbles carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is not something that the body really is very keen to have inside it. So it goes into your tummy and it very, very rapidly gets into your bloodstream straight away. I mean, within seconds, your blood is, get, absorbs carbon dioxide and wants to get rid of it. So it races around your system. You know, this is not a medical lecture, but this is my understanding, um, and goes straight to where it counts in your brain. So you get giggly alarmingly fast. Hmm. Wow, yeah. Well, the bub, uh, the heart wants to get it out of its system, just like as though you're oh. working out almost. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think that it's a, a requirement or a good thing even to taste high quality wines at the beginning of your wine journey um, is that important to, to understand wines, to taste really top quality wines well, at the beginning? To, to realize how, how different the quality can be. So, you know, if you mm -hmm. only ever drank the best wine, uh, you would think, well, that's the standard. That's what I can expect wine to be. <laughs> but if you drink sure. on something less, uh, of lesser quality, or, um, 
something more ordinary, then you're bound to notice and say, this is so much better. Why? Where's it come from? <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's it's always the comparison. And as you say so eloquently, and I'll, I'll, I won't be able to paraphrase as eloquently, you bring yourself to the point of being able to see where the pleasure lies. You don't want to perhaps leap to high-priced wines right away, but you need to know the differences, um, oh, yes, which I just love. I mean, there's a place, there is a, there is a place for for great wine, if you can afford it. Uh, sure. And there's obviously a place for what I call everyday wine. Uh, and in between, I sort of make rather artificial grades. I, there's a whole category that I that I call fine wine. And mm. people ask me, well, what do you mean by fine wine? And I mm. tend to say, well, it's wine that's worth talking about. You see, mm. ordinary wine, mm -hmm wine, there's nothing more to say. Fine wine, you say to yourself, hmm, hey, it's not quite uh, not quite what I expected, or it's really rather delicious, or I love the smell, or something like that. And then you get into a category that generally I call fine. In between, you know, okay, wine, basic, good wine, much better and something you really want, fine wine, something that... Uh, uh, you ask questions about because I, I always say that um, fine wine doesn't make statements it asks questions you want to know mm. more right and what kind of questions <laughs> does it ask you you it just provokes your curiosity can you think of a wine that kind yes. of asked it, you a lot of questions <laughs> well it, it I don't basically it makes you want to have well, I have more. I mean, sip again, sniff it more, mm -hmm. more deeply, concentrate on it, pay attention to it. But uh, I think that some people make the mistake that uh, very good wine will somehow tell you it's very good at the first sip. Well, it might, but the first thing you have to do is concentrate and to, to notice it. And... Um, it's the first rule of wine tasting is you, you sort of rigmarole is you look at the colour, you sniff it, you take a sip. But then when you take a sip, you actually think. You keep it in your mouth for a moment or two and you sort of chew it, you swirl it around a bit. And uh, then it, it registers and you, you've actually had the experience and then you can like it or not like it, you could judge it, uh, but that then then you really have had that wine's experience. Mm. That's a great, great advice for tasting, for everyone who wants to improve their tasting ability, or just their pleasure. <laughs> um, <laughs> you described your writing, writing career as taking off when you began writing for uh, Vogue magazine, and you published your first article for the magazine in December in the December 1960 issue, what was it about? Oh, good Lord, yes. It's quite the Christmas issue. The editor sent it, me oh. off and said, um, you want to write about wine, Hugh? Because I was a general sort of feature writer at the time. And I said, yes. Okay. She said, well, what are we going to do for Christmas? And I said, well, suppose I ask two or three people who are known for their love of wine, possibly for their riches as well, <laughs> what they're going to have for Christmas, you see. So I went round and I did. I mean, I, I collared a famous um, uh, millionaire, anyway, a couple of well-known names, and, um, and, and I took down their answers, and that was my first wine article. Wines for Christmas, how seasonal. It's last. It's a, it's a topic that comes up every year, 60 years later. Which wines for Christmas or holiday turkey? <laughs> well, it's like the, one of the great virtues of wine as a subject for a writer is that it's, um, there's always a new vintage. I mean, you know, it's I could, true. Uh, I've sold many, many copies of my little annual Hugh Johnson's Pocket Wine Book. Uh, because there's always news on the wine front. You know, if we're talking about yeah. trees, which is the other subject I love writing about, uh, you know, an oak remains an oak. It's not a different oak next year. 
Right. That's true. It's got this built-in, you know, renewal cycle to it. <laughs> For both the plants and the writer. <laughs> That's great. Um, and how did working at such a, a fashion-focused magazine like Vogue um, shape your approach to writing about wine, or did it? No, not really. I think it was just I wanted somebody to publish my work. You know, I was brand new. <laughs> I hadn't had anything published right. before. But the um, uh, I know what happened. I hadn't thought about this for the last half century. Um, <laughs> A friend of mine at Cambridge University uh, had been offered a job on, on Vogue magazine. I can't think why he was, but he was. And then he was offered another job in television. And in those days, television was something very special, hardly known. Hmm. See how old I am. And uh, so he said, look, uh, Vogue would take me, take me on board. Why don't you do the job instead. And so I went and saw the editor of Vogue and she said, well, yeah, um, give it a go. And uh, it must have worked. I'd say it did. <laughs> I think things rolled along pretty nicely after that, You, <laughs> That's great. Now, you published your first book in, on wine in 1966 when you were just 27 years old. Um, what was it called, and what gave you the confidence to do that at such a young age? Well, the title was just the four-letter word, W-I-N-E, <laughs> my favorite. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I was, I know, God, you're bringing me, reminding me of things I hadn't thought about for years. I hope but, that's a good thing. <laughs> oh, it is, it is. Uh, okay. the, the publisher okay. had had a smash hit with the first sort of coffee table cookbook. Um, made a beautiful production of it, colour photos, uh, and it sold. It was a, um, an American author called Robert Carrier, uh, who became very well known as a result. And he even got on television, imagine. <laughs> oh, wow. What did he write about? What was that book about? Oh, it was a book of recipes. Just cooking. Oh, recipes, okay, food. Well, uh -huh. yeah. So, um, his publisher had the idea, or was given the idea, that if you could sell a coffee table book about cooking, perhaps you could about wine. So he asked me to come up with a uh, big book, colored cover, color plates. I mean, in those days in publishing, Text and, and, and pictures were not integrated very much. It was so much simpler to have a, a, a colour page printing and separately the text, and so they, don't, they weren't properly integrated. It looked pretty primitive by today's standards, but that's the way it was. So I had to take these colour photographs, and that's why I discovered my skills as a photographer. <laughs> I went out with my Rolleiflex camera, and photographed everything that I thought looked good in the, in the, in the wide field. I did still lifes, um, masterpieces, of course, because they were published. <laughs> anyway, that, the first book, that's how it came about. <laughs> wow. And did your experience as a magazine editor help you to better integrate, like, the color photos, the captions, and I think, as you call the text, the gray stuff? Good point, but that came later, you see. This book, first book was very simple. It was text and color plates. Uh, and then I went back into the magazine business. I'd been working for Condé Nast, for Vogue, House and Garden, and uh, they started a little magazine which was actually called Wine and Food. And I was given the editorship, uh, and so I, I learned quite a lot about editing. And uh, there's just a little noise off, off, off stage. Oh, that's okay. Um, <laughs> so I, um, I th as I say, I thought we could integrate things, and then came the offer. I'd be, I'd, that's right. I was editing a magazine called Queen, which was the sort of fashion and social glossy of the time mm -hmm. in London. Uh, and I'd done that for not very long when 
an editor came to me and said, we are working with a Dutch cartographer, a map maker. And he <laughs> says, what about the relationship between maps and wine? Because wines are called after where they come from. So suppose we show people these places. Um, and I said, wow, but could you afford really good maps? I mean, I would want ordnance survey level maps. Uh, and he somehow produced a huge advance for the book. By those standards of those days, I do remember it was a hundred thousand pounds, which today would be a wow. million. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. And so we created these absolutely amazing maps, really. We were the first people to map the vineyards of the world uh, in this degree of detail. And once you get to the detail, then you can really explain the differences. And you could say this could be simple, you know, this is a, a south facing hill slope, or it's not, it's something else. Uh, and, and you show it to people. And that, that, that actually was quite revolutionary. Because instead mm -hmm. of just, you know, you, in the text, you have a list of names and you say, this is the Medoc, and it goes Saint Estef, Royac, Saint Julien, Margot, blah, blah. Uh, but actually, if you show them that this is the land itself, look at it. The detail, mm -hmm. you can decide where to have your picnic on <laughs> it. Um, mm -hmm. So that was totally convincing, and that really worked. And the book sold, and still says, still sells. It does, it does. And that was in 1971, and things have changed so much. There's been multiple editions since, but am I correct in asking, was New Zealand not even in that book because literally New Zealand wines weren't on the map yet? There wasn't any New Zealand wine at all. Right. Well, there was, wow. there was, the, the, there was something called Dalle Planck. I have to explain that. Okay. A, a lot of the miners in New Zealand were immigrants from Dalmatia, and they were called Dalis. Uh, and they, with the, Dalmatia being a wine growing country, they planted vines and they made wine. And so, this was I, pretty much the first New Zealand wine was Dali Plonk. Uh, and then they realized that, that it was much better than Plonk. You know, they really have the climate a very similar climate to France in some cases, uh, and that they could upgrade, and they did. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. I mean, it, it, you've just seen so many changes over the years, I mean, from the time you started to, to now. What's been the most surprising change you've seen in the world of wine, if you can name one? I know there's been many. There are so many. Um, yeah. A general upgrade in quality, there's no doubt about that. I mean, you used to be able, without any difficulty, to find bad wine. Now, I really challenge almost anybody now to go out and buy a bad wine. We, we don't need mm -hmm. to make it, so we don't do it. I mean, the, the, the technique um, has been perfected, and uh, we have also, of course, Good wine, certainly fine wine, used to be limited pretty much to France, a little bit to Italy, to Germany definitely, to Austria, funnily enough, uh, and, and that was it. Other people made perfectly decent wine, but not fine wine. They didn't see it in that way. Right. Uh, and, uh, well, that sort of, that idea sunk in, and people realized that the, the, the basis of any fine wine was the grape variety. So they start to look at the grape varieties. And I do remember actually in, in the States there was a friend of mine who was a war correspondent in the Second World War called Frank Schoonmaker. And he'd been in, in France after the, during the war and he had learned to taste wine in Burgundy, I think. Uh, and Frank who wrote for the New York Times uh, and he he wrote uh, a little wine encyclopedia, and he asked me to do an English version of it, or to get rid of the Americanisms. <laughs> and and, and yeah. so we published it in England, and it was a big success. Um, and so, uh, how did I get round to talking about Frank? <laughs> You're talking about fine wines and identifying them through the grapes, that yeah, sort of thing? Um, 
as the appreciation developed. At California Winery, uh, called, never mind, uh, when California wine was pretty plonky, frankly, there was very, very little mm-hmm. fine wine, if any, in California there. He was advising them, and he told them that if they were going to make better white wine, they were planting Chardonnay grapes. The best red wine was from Cabernet Sauvignon grapes. It was as simple as that. Uh, and he said, well, put it on the label. Don't just right. say... Uh, something country, you know, uh, but put the grape variety on the label. And that was almost, that was immediately convincing. It had sort of raised the bar. If you're planting the best grape varieties, you can expect better wine. And um, that was, uh, that was a historic moment. It really was. Mm-hmm. That's revolutionary for even the understanding of wine, appreciation of it here in North America to be able to identify and ask for a certain grape Um, because up till then it it had all been just regions and Europe was a kind of a mystery because it was all regional people weren't sure what the grapes were if they you know didn't have wine knowledge it was just California wine the sunshine states bound to be good yes (laughs) yeah (laughs) Um, well speaking of fine wines um, Tell us about buying your first bottle of 1961 Bordeaux. I think it was actually a mixed case that you bought. Um, And maybe tell us what you paid for it. Well, 1961 came around, and it was very clear from the beginning there was going to be a great vintage. I mean, the the weather conditions were right. It was a warm summer. The the grapes ripened at the right time. They were not overbaked when they were picked in the vintage time. Uh, and people tasted it and said, this has everything. It's one of the, mm. the only vintage of my lifetime, I think, when the consensus has been, has been this has everything. So um, wow. I was carried away by this, and I spent a little bit of, a, a little of my tiny earnings, I it must have been a month's wages, I should think, on buying a, mm. a mixed case of the first growth from Bordeaux. Of, the, of that wine and I resisted drinking it because I had learned that you know great wine is a matter of time you don't, you don't, you don't just buy it and drink it and um, I think I drank my last bottle of those four different first growths about something like 40 years later <laughs> so wow. it, had, it had evolved that- It had gone through this sort of magic uh, maturation, that mellowing that wine does, and it had become a different substance and magic. Hmm. Wow, very patient, waiting for it that long. And that would have been like Lafitte, Latour, Margot? Exactly, it was Lafitte, Latour, Margot, and Aubryon, the four great first girls. Magical. Do you remember what you paid for it? I know it was a month's earnings, but uh, well, in fact, do you remember the price back then? Imagination. I mean, I'm more familiar with them now, obviously. So, yes, I mean, yeah, true. I know, I mean, uh, great, great pleasure, great moment. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, when you've reflected uh, in your book on Bordeaux from 1982, you describe it as a year of pleasure where personal milestones intertwine with wine moments. And I love the way you weave those two together. Was there a particular moment or wine that stood out for you that year? In 82, um, oh gosh. Now, I don't remember it for one Really one, one amazing bottle, but lots of amazing bottles. <laughs> that was the way it was. It was a big, sure. uh, it was very untypical of the Bordeaux that I got used to up to then because it was a very warm year. And it pleased the great American wine critic, Robert Parker. And he was mm-hmm. always looking for uh, concentration in wine dark colour in red wine, alcohol, high alcohol content. Uh, 
he wasn't into subtlety at all, old Parker. Uh, <laughs> And from the very first, you said you had to have a stomach for hyperbole <laughs> to read some of the tasting <laughs> notes. Yes. Just a subtle so way to put it. it. We, we were friendly, but we never read from the same page at all. Right, but you did read one of a few of his pages um, back in 1978 when you were with your publisher. It was your first time not only encountering Robert Parker, but um, tell us about that. It was your first time encountering something else when it came to wine and description? You, you, you've got all the stories. <laughs> yes, it's tr quite, quite great true. stories. Uh, quite true. Um, my London publisher came up to me and said, "This book is doing amazingly in America. It's so just rushing off the shelves. Um, why don't you read it and have a look?" And uh, I did, and I said. In the margin, it was well edited, and in the margin, it, it gave the vintage. It went through the vintages, okay, sort of seventy-eight, seventy-nine, eighty, eighty-one, and then there was another figure beside it, a figure like ninety or ninety-two or something like that. And I said, "Well, yeah, that's the vintage, but what, what's this figure here? That's the score." I said, "The what?" Score wines don't have scores. Uh, how can you score wine? And they said, "Well, it's the the um, Detroit does it with motor cars. You know, Americans like scores. They like to know where they are in some ranking, which is unspecified. Really, it's, a, it's the palate of a of a critic um, who gets more and more excited and ups and ups and ups the score." And I said, well, you can't do that. There is no uh, objective scale. It's giving a, the wrong impression to people to say that this wine is better in an abstract way than another wine. I mean, I, maybe my mind has changed about that a little. But at the time, I, I said, you know, it, it's, it's not mechanistic like that at all. Wines are good in right. different ways. You know, a, a really good uh, wine from the from the Loire in France is can be brilliant in a lovely, fresh, uh, refreshing way with lots of fruity flavours, which you won't find in a wine from the River Rhone, which is quite a different, mm. different grape varieties, different climate, different qualities. So I said, how do you sure. score things as different as that? I said, do you? Uh, how about scoring Mozart operas, or like try scoring your friends? <laughs> Why <Wines, laughs> are my friends? <laughs> exactly. How do you trap a subjective experience into a, what seems like an objective number? I mean, it, it, it yeah. just seems kind of tricky. Um, but did did have, have you changed your mind a little bit on scores? You you alluded to that. Well, if, if you um, if you contextualize it, if you, you say we are scoring things within a narrow range of qualities and so on, then obviously you can make it happen, and it has to happen all the time because that's how professional wine tasters do their job. I mean, in some right. cases, the American way was to mark uh, out of a hundred, or rather, that's not quite true, uh, as in school exam marking. It actually, it ran from 50 to 100, so nothing was humiliating <laughs> by scoring 20. <laughs> we, so, um, nobody ever did mark as low as 50. I mean, if you look at the Parker-type scores in wine magazines and that kind of thing, even the wine they really don't like would get something like 70. Um, but then there's a lot of hyperbole in the, um, as the scores get more exciting. So, mm -hmm. uh, what was I saying? Uh, scoring wine, you know, to me, it doesn't so you work. you think within a context they could be useful today? Oh yes, I mean, um, if I scores, yeah. If I'm at a, at a wine tasting, a professional tasting, tasting, um, I'm usually given a sort of sheet of paper with the names of the wines, and the other tasters, there were always a bunch of us, will write down scores. What I do in that case, very often on a 
a bench along the wall, the wine bottles are lined up. Uh, and as I go along the line, sniffing and sipping and spitting, if I like something, I'll pull the bottle a bit towards me, and if I don't, I'll push it a bit back. So at the end of the tasting, you've got a sort of jagged line like that, and I know which, <laughs> one, which my favourites have been, and I go back and uh, taste them again, and uh, come to a conclusion, yeah. or try to. Right. I think that's a great way to do it. <laughs> um, because, you know, the other challenge, I agree with you that to learn about wine, side-by-side -side tastings are terrific, and um, I suppose uh, those of us who write about wine are tasting a group of similar wines to compare them, but I like, you were quoting one winemaker who said, I don't make my, my wines to go with other wines, I make them to go with food. So there's a, a bit of a, right, like this environment. Yeah, as soon as you start uh, lining up wines to taste against other wines, certain wines will stand out rather than the kind of wines that, that Robert Parker likes. Uh, right. If it's a wine that's got more alcohol and more body and something, it will it will hide. Uh, if you drive around France, you'll see where there's a, a railroad crossing. There's a warning sign which says, um, um, uh, un train peut cacher un autre. A train, a, a train can hide another train. Look down the line. So uh. I say, un vin peut cacher un autre. <laughs> right. That's true. Get overpower or hide. Yeah, yeah. that's a, an excellent point. Absolutely. Um, now, one thing that came through clearly is your love of Bordeaux and or claret um, over the years, and and you've maintained that. Now, Eric Asimov, um, the wine columnist for the New York Times, wrote the intro for your memoir. Um, wonderful. In it, he refers to Burgundy, the home of Pinot Noir, and says that, generally speaking, it has won out over Bordeaux over the years. And I'm just going to quickly quote, it has cap captured the imagination of much of the world, while Cabernet Sauvignon, Bordeaux's signature grape, is often merely tolerated. <laughs> what has kept you loyal to Bordeaux over these years? Well, I suppose that must be true, because of the sheer quantities of it. I mean, Cabernet Sauvignon is planted in every wine-growing country, I would imagine. Uh, so, uh, it, uh, yes, it, it, at a certain level you're merely tolerating it because it's familiar. You know, you quite like something because you know what it is and it's familiar, so you tolerate it. Um, Pinot Noir doesn't really operate on quite that level, or or didn't until very recently. I mean, Burgundy used mm. to be unique. It really did. I mean, the only good Pinot Noir in the world came from Burgundy. So, of course, winemakers in other places wanted to show that they could do it too. And so over the over, over the over many years, I mean, this they've been trying to catch up with Burgundy for forty years, I suppose. And only quite recently have they found the places where it'll work, of which um, one is, is, is Oregon, there's no doubt. You see, California tends to over-ripen it. I mean, I'm not saying there are no good Burgundies, no good Pinot Noirs from California, but you look further north to cool up climate, uh, you get closer to the Burgundy model. And uh, the other place where this happens is, is New Zealand. Which is doing very, very well. Mm. In Australia, it I don't know that, that sort of lives up to the model. Sure, sure. And do you think that Bordeaux wins out because it's a less floppy wine than Pinot Noir or than Burgundy? Uh, there's so much more of Bordeaux, you see. Bordeaux is a, the biggest wine region in France. Uh, samples from lots of different soil types. And within Bordeaux, quite differences in, in weather or even climate. Uh, so sure. um, there's far more opportunities to be for, for, for the quality, you know, higher or lower quality, but right. also character from the different soils and everything else. I mean, so right. clarity is a great range. 
and Burgundy is all trying yes. to do the same thing. Huh. That's interesting. I agree. And as you say, somewhere in your book, it's, there's sort of different takes on the same plot. So there's more variety when it comes yes. to Bordeaux. Um, I mean, when you get down to the nitty gritty and you look at a map of, of the Cote d'Or, the heart of, uh, of Burgundy, you can see why uh, it's tiny little plots, like a, a, a couple right. of acres or a hectare have their own character and then you look closely at the soil but this is really unmanageable you know you get you become splitting hairs honestly uh, so that's not the way that uh, that the wine trade really handles it I mean basically they realize that you need to be able to identify a kind of thing rather than just a, the individual thing itself hmm. yes Absolutely. So after the success of your first uh, two books, your publisher asked what was next. And um, share your answer because it does connect with your other passion, what he thought he heard and what you, what you actually said at first. I said trees. And he said, cheese, yes, that's great. You want to write about trees. <laughs> cheese. I said, no, we are. Trees, he said. Oh. He said, that's not a consumer subject. That won't work. But it did work, in fact, <laughs> and I don't take all the credit for it, but because uh, I had a great friend um, who was staying with us and we were discussing what I was working on. And uh, he said, oh, and it's going to be a big illustrated book, like wine books. And I said, well, that's what I want, but who will pay for it? And he said, wait a moment. He said, I've got a client who is the biggest paper maker in America or um, it's called the International Paper Company um, <laughs> so he introduced me to uh, board members of it and I said could you help me I want to travel all over the states I want to go to the forests of the northwest down to Georgia and see the pines there and, and, and so on and they said, well, um, that could be really interesting. We've got our 75th anniversary or something coming up. And if you do this the way you did the wine book, we could buy uh, a lot of copies to give to our friends and clients and something. And that's what they did. They, they underwrote the book. Uh, they told the publisher they'd take like a lot of copies, like 50,000 or some huge number like that. Oh, wow. Which That's made a lot of trees. The, <laughs> it, it made the whole yes, made the whole thing viable, uh, and so I set off visiting the forests of America, and, and um, huh. that was a, a great time I had. It was very different wow. from the wine wow. world. Yes, absolutely. And you've written five books, I believe, on gardening, and authored a column mm -hmm. for the Horticultural Society for fifty years. How has your writing about gardening influenced your approach to wine writing, or has it, or vice versa? It's just be trying to exploit the wonderful vocabulary that the English language has. After all, we are so lucky to have a language which unites the, the, the brilliance of uh, the Latin languages with a lot of influence from the German school, as it were. Uh, so we have a vast vocabulary, and um, I want to exploit it. And it, 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 wine is a really challenge. It's a great challenge because there are no words that actually match the taste of wine. The, the, the words that go the, for taste are very limited. I mean, it's sweet, sour, bitter, and then you sort of run out of precise taste words. So you bring in. Mm. Uh, metaphor, you bring in analogies with other things, uh, which I jo just so enjoyed. I mean, to me, it, it's the essence of writing, is looking around experience and saying, it's, it's a bit like that, um, in some regard, in some respects. Sure. But there is an infinite variety of ways to, to describe wine. Um, what do you think the two share, gardening and winemaking? 
plants, of course, <coughs> but is there something beyond that? I, I would answer that by saying that they're both applying human skills, intelligence and taste to natural objects. You know, a great mm. is a natural fruit, uh, you could, if, when, when you apply those qualities of science and intelligence and taste to it, then you begin to find more possibilities and, and make more different products from it. Um, gardening is just the same. I mean, we, who needs 450 varieties of rose? Well, there are probably more than that. You know, they, they're not needed, but they interest people and people enjoy them, so why not? Mm, absolutely. Do you think there's a bit of a commonality between weeding and editing? <laughs> yes, there certainly is. <laughs> <laughs> you, you edit the garden, don't you? When you go out there and your fork and spade, you're editing. Yes, yes. And you say you like to garden with a light touch. Do you... Do you, did you try to apply that approach to writing about wine as well? A light touch. Hmm. Uh, well, in, in, in a sense, you know, I'm one of those people who's terribly curious. I really, I always want to know what's round the corner, what's going to happen next. Uh, so that leads me into, in gardening, it's obvious, trying so many different plants. Uh, and in wine, it's, it's the same thing. You know, you... I would, I, I, I used to be infinitely curious. I have to say that I'm a bit, I, I've made some favourites over time and I'm less passionately keen to know what is outside my <laughs> rather limited field of, of enjoyment. That's just sure. what happens with age, I'm afraid. Sure, but it's that lifelong curiosity that has probably kept you going on, on both wine and gardening right. all of these years, I would think. Yeah. In fact, I think um, it's a very valuable um, gift to have. Um, I wrote, when a child is born, you hope that it has this gift or that gift, or I do, and I would like it to have two. Uh, curiosity and a sense of humor. <laughs> Mm -hmm. They're both a great That's help true. in life. Yes, they help in life and in relationships. <laughs> I think yeah, yeah. the ability to laugh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When you have a career or relationship setbacks, it's humor that will save you often. Yeah, exactly. um, so do you have a favorite place to combine your two passions? Like, where do you like to have a glass of wine? Whether it's where you are now, I believe you live in London, but you also had a home in the country at Sailing Hall. Where yes. was your favorite well, place to enjoy it? Well, we, we, we lived at this rather lovely old um, manor house, sort of um, 16th century house, not very far from London, actually. We lived there for more than 40 years. So I've had all every sort of experience there. And it also had extraordinary cellars. I mean, country houses of the Elizabethan Jacobean period, around 1600, uh, don't usually have, never had wine cellars because they didn't have wine to keep. You know, wine came, in, wine came in a barrel, but nobody had bottled wine in those days. They hadn't even got, got around to inventing the cork and the corkscrew, <laughs> so they couldn't. Um, so, yes, we, we had um, the most perfect cellars, and that was a place where I probably enjoyed the very best wines that I've had. We used to give dinner parties a lot, and uh, we had a, a, a little club with six members called the Bordeaux Club. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, well, the whole point of this club, they tended to be, the members were um, professors or doms from Cambridge University or some wine merchants from London, and we used to meet fairly regularly and produce the best food we possibly could, and our best wines, that was the whole thing. You didn't stint, if you had a great wine, that's where you drank it, which is common sense. I mean, the, the, one of the hardest things about wine is if you have a very, very good bottle, who are you going to share it with? And most right. of all, I was going to say, thanks, that was nice. 
<laughs> they're not going to want to talk about it. Uh, and what you right. want is a conversation. Yes, with someone who who can appreciate it. Uh, yeah. That that is everything, isn't it? But your 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 home at Sailing Hall it had five different rooms in the cellar. It was extraordinary. No idea why, because as I said, <laughs> houses of that period didn't have wine, so why would they want cellars? And we never answered hmm. that. Actually, um, wow. people say, "Well, it was a game larder. You you had a lot of game. You wanted to keep it somewhere cool, and you would never put you never put game in those cellars for long." I mean, the stick would be too much. Um, so sure. I'll never know why it has those cellars, but I fill them up. Oh, wow. You were able to fill up the five rooms. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that must have been quite the move when you then moved to London trying to, I guess, sell a portion of well, it or we, transport we, we, we them. Had, we had an auction sale. I had to. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that must have been a big auction. <laughs> 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 and you mentioned the dinners with your, your Bordeaux club. Do you remember the, or can you tell us about the dinner you had with Richard Joffrey, the blender for Dom Perignon? Ah, oh, that wasn't actually the Bordeaux club. That was another group, another dinner. Uh, yes, indeed, right. well, on several occasions. And, of course, I went over to Champagne and he shared... Um, he didn't really share secrets, no, that wasn't what he did. He showed you how many, when you're blending champagne, how many potential component parts there are in a blend. You know, we could use huh. some, white, some, some white grapes from there and so on, which was the, sort of in, in the legend of Dom Perignon, who was supposed to have invented champagne, which he, he certainly didn't, but I mean, he was a, a great blender, he was a monk in the monastery mm -hmm. there with vineyards and there are lots of legends about him. One of them being that he, he, he was blind so he had to tell what the wine from one village, the wine from another, tasting blind literally and he developed this skill mm -hmm. but all this is just, it's all legend really. I mean he undoubtedly blended wine very well but he happened to live at the moment when Champagne became really interesting. It used to be sort of the common wine of Paris at one point because it was not processed in the way it is now. The, the, the champagne method of making it bubbly was, uh, curiously enough, actually came about in England. People find it. The French don't enjoy this story all that much. <laughs> <laughs> the reason they want to own it, along with the story of Dom Perignon. <laughs> was because if you uh, keep the cork in a champagne bottle, uh, if, if you keep it in, if you tie it in, as they used to with string, and now we do it with wire, um, and the wine ferments in the bottle, the bottle explodes. I mean, it can't stand yes. pressure. Uh, the French didn't have bottles that would take the, pl the pressure, but huh. we did in England for a certain reason. And it's a strange story, but under our King, King James I, the beginning of the 17th century, uh, we had to build a, a big fleet for the Navy. You know, we were in danger and we had to protect our little island, so we built this. And the King said, all the good oak trees are for ships. You can't do anything else with this oak. We, it, you know, it was that the one material for building ships um, and so we've got a if you've got a if you're going to make glass you need a furnace you've got a very high temperature so he said right in future you're going to use coal coal which huh? mainly comes from the north of England from Newcastle and up there uh, right and that started a lot of coal mining because the coal came down and if heated the, the glass furnaces really hot and the glass got, it got darker but it also got stronger and they found that it could take pressure because of the higher oh, temperature wow. you were making strong glass and, um, and that meant that if you filled it with wine that was 
liable to ferment and create pressure and you tied the cork on, the bingo, when you cut the string and the cork, cork popped out and you'd got bubbly wine. <laughs> wow. Didn't have to wear the iron mask to dinner <laughs> in case they exploded. <laughs> But you were with you were with jo uh, Richard uh, Joffrey with this sort of champagne pairing dinner. Um, I loved how you described some of it. You said champagne is perfect, uh, or scallops are perfect champagne fodder. Um, the rich tang of the foreshore they taste like iodine cream. Oh, so so lovely. Um, and I love when you talk about food and wine pairing. Did your friendship with the influential food writer Elizabeth David influence the way you talked about food and wine? Well, it certainly taught me a lot about food and cooking. Mm. But before that, my, my patron was Andre Simon, okay. uh, who started the Wine and Food Society. Because uh, I, I met him, was, uh, he was, I was 21, he was 81. Oh, but, wow. but we somehow talked to each other. I mean, we became friends. And so he promoted me to, to run the Wine and Food Society for a while and to edit their magazine, which is called Wine and Food. So that was a big entree into, into the business. Then later on, when I was editing this little magazine, Wine and Food, uh, not a glossy, but a sort of serious looking magazine then, just words, I went and knocked at the door, the London door, of my absolute hero, my heroine in the in food, who was Elizabeth David. And she was the poet of, of um, food writers. Uh, uh, she was a scholar. She looked back at history. She produced recipes that hadn't been used for 200 years. And sort of really, uh, gave recipe writing and the whole business of food writing another dimension. And she was a heroine of mine, I thought she was marvellous. One day I knocked at her door and said, um, I've got this little magazine, I'll never be happy until you write for it. And she, she was a, not an easy woman at all actually. She didn't suffer fools. Um, but she said, come in. I went into her kitchen, there was a marvellous smell of bread baking and something on the stove. And uh, I sat down and I said, you write like an angel. I must have a piece for my magazine. And uh, she said, well, wait a minute, I'll, I'll have a look. I've got lots of pieces for lots of magazines. There must be something that hasn't been published that I can give you. And that's, that's uh, and then that's how I got her, <laughs> and we became friends. Wow. Oh, that's marvelous. Her, was her book Consider the Omelette or something like that? Um, I'm not sure what book it's I was a, thinking of the other day. Oh, are you, are, but, you're not uh, thinking about uh, M.F.K. Fisher, are you? Oh, yes, I am. I think you They're are both right. heroines, but yeah. yes, yes, it's true. Okay. Good. Yes. Um... What is the oldest wine you've tasted, Hugh? Oh, well, it probably old. Um, well, we all remember the 1564 vintage, don't we? <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> right. Like it was yesterday. Oh, the rains that year. <laughs> I'm not, have I got, actually got precisely the right year? I think so. Anyway, it was about the same, about the time Shakespeare was born. Wow. And it was an amazing vintage, and in Germany it was a total legend. Uh, the Rhine, the River Rhine dried up, and, and you know, people say that the stone masons were using wine instead of water because they didn't have any water. Um, oh. So this uh, was such a, a spectacular occasion that they built a special barrel for it big barrel, uh, and they kept this wine in the barrel for, until there were bottles. It had to stay in bottle, it had, it had to stay in barrel for about 200 years, until somebody invented the wine bottle. Um, My goodness. Obviously it didn't stay, because it, you know, with 
hullage, I mean, evaporation, the level would have gone down. So what did they do? They topped up the barrel uh, with the best wine they could find, or if they didn't have any good enough, what they used to do was drop stones in the barrel to keep the level up. Um, huh. And so this wine eventually was bottled, and a couple of well, the remaining couple of bottles were auctioned, I think. No, they were. They were bought by uh, a king of Bavaria, celebrated as the the Mad Queen, the Mad King Ludwig of Bavaria. I don't think he was mad at all. <laughs> he built crazy castles, but he had a jolly good wine cellar. And <laughs> somehow or other, a couple of these bottles came into came to London and I was invited to taste one of them. So yes, I did taste a wine from before Shakespeare was born, but it was um, it, it was very, very old. That's what I can say about it. In fact, actually... <laughs> did it taste it, it, all right? Did it, Or was it vinegar? Or what did it taste no, like? It wasn't. The point is, it was still alive. I mean, it was a hmm. wine alive or dead. You know, once it's vinegar, that's it. But it was still whiny. Um, huh. It was pretty dark brown, a little bit thick, but it was right, like tasting a very, very old Madeira or something like that. Mm. And wow. uh, so I could say I have actually consumed something that was ripened by the sun 300, 400 years ago. That's incredible. Wow. That is incredible. That's oh, only possible. My goodness. Why? Wine is the only substance that could possibly keep like that. That's <laughs> true, and you talk about the fourth element of wine as being time. Um, yeah. You talk about wines of curiosity versus conviction in your cellar. What's the difference for you? Well, because it's been my trade to write about the wines of the world, I've had to be, well, I am anyway, but I've had to be curious. You know, I've had to have a Catholic uh, uh, array and so that's the, uh, and, then, and then I'm curious, as I said earlier. Uh, conviction, well, you know, you, with time you narrow down uh, your choices, things you don't really know, you know you love, you know more about them too, because you go into more depth. I think when I said conviction, that's probably what I meant. Right. Right, absolutely. So just a few more questions. I, I appreciate your time, Hugh. So what do you, where do you think wine communication is going in the future? Are we just going to boil it all down to emojis? Or <laughs> what, do you, what, what do you hope will happen with wine communication? Yeah. There's already too much of it thought about. I mean, you, there is the internet. You can get anybody's opinion on any wine just mm -hmm. on your laptop. So... Uh, Oh, I think there will be a, there is a public for books that take a, a, a long, hard, intelligent look at the whole thing and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, express it in, a, in a, an interesting, readable, preferably amusing way. You know, there, there's a public for good writing about anything, isn't there, really? There is. Well, Absolutely. <laughs> Good writing never goes out of fashion. What do you hope your legacy to the wine world will be? Well, yeah, that's a very difficult question. Uh, a lot of maps, for one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ways, ways of talking about wine, uh, ideas, opening up the field of ways of talking about wine in terms of, of similes and metaphors and stories. Uh, I don't know if they'll actually have any influence on any other writers, that's not what I'm for. But if people enjoy what I write, then that's the whole point. Absolutely, and you already have had profound influence on a lot of writers, including Aaron, Eric Asimov, who says he's tried to style his own writing after you in that intro. Um, did you say that? Of course. Did you really? Oh, bless you, Eric. He did, yes. <laughs> you should reread re -read your book. 
Um, this is marvelous. Yeah, there's so many more topics we could have covered, and you do in your wonderful book. So we have those. Um, I'll try not to jam it all into this conversation, but I, I've loved chatting with you. Your stories are amazing. I do well, encourage well, everyone to go out and buy. You're very good at asking all your questions. Books. You're, you're an absolute Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, that's sweet. That's very kind of you. Um, of course, your the life and time, life and wines of Hugh Johnson is available from Academy du Vin. Um, the yeah, story of wine. I, oh, sorry. there it is. There's the book. Hold it up. Yes, good product placement. And we'll put a, a link in the show notes to the book. We'll link to Academy du Vin, um, to all of your books. Of course, the pocketbook, the the atlas. The, there are just so many. Um, so. I am going to say goodbye for now, but don't uh, log off yet, Hugh. But thank you again so much for taking this time. Um, it's meant a lot to me personally, and I know our listeners are just going to love listening to this conversation. Just you've contributed so much to the wine world, and um, we thank you for it. Thank you. All right. Cheers.